It's time for the Daily Stand-Up Podcast presented by Agile Dad with your host, Lee Henson. Without any further ado, let's get started. I've been in organizations where analysts are often asked to stay away from solutioning. And I think that that's understood as saying, as saying hey, just stay away from the solution. I can tell you that that's not always the case, right? Um, there are several times where opportunities happen. I remember once after completing a very intense requirements planning session uh, with a lot of analysis where we're looking into uh, things that were going to happen, doing some case studies and use cases and doing some journey mapping that between 15 and 20 stakeholders were involved and it was just a marathon of different workshops that we had, different focus groups, different uh, different avenues of gathering information. And to our nightmare, to our dismay, what, what, what cranked out of this ended up being like a multi-hundred page technical user requirements document. Uh, and, and I use that analogy affectionately because it's a turd, uh, but it was only for the interface alone. Uh, there was a whole, a whole bunch of other things that were captured in a spreadsheet. There were diagrams, decision tables, um, story mapping, journey mapping, and all kinds of other good stuff. In other words, we were trying to build a really complex system. Now, once the final signature dried on the requirements document, the dedicated design and development team took over and said, hey, we're going to use Agile to build this, and we're on our way. Well... They were all seasoned, and uh, we had lots of consultants that were hired from the outside to come in uh, for the contract for the sole purpose of making sure we delivered the system on time and that we stayed within our budget and that we were that we were cracking the whip as hard as we could. But what I found was that the analysts kind of felt like a third wheel. It was really, really interesting to watch the way the analysts were behaving. Uh The business analyst who was misbehaving, and I approached him and said, hey, what's going on? And she was quick to let me know. She said, I've been asked uh, not to communicate with the development team. I'm like, what? She says, yeah, they told me not to communicate with the team in any way. And as the company was paying all of these really high paid consultants and coaches a lot of money to get the job done, They were to receive their instructions from and report to a single manager who, who, uh, so that they don't receive conflicting information. So it comes out to be less expensive in the end. Now, one knows, (laughs) I've worked enough to know that a single manager doesn't know everything, right? It's almost the same theory as saying a single product owner knows everything. I was just left to wonder what was happening to the morale of this team? What was happening to the infrastructure of the system? Um, it was conceived by so many different people and dozens of dozens of animated meetings and exchanges and talks. And the consultants just kept to them, kept it to themselves. And they were rarely even in the office to, to pay attention to us or to meet with us or to talk to us about things that were going on. They provided clear timelines of what we needed to do and how we're going to work towards building things in their world. I don't think you need to guess what happened next, right? The designated contact manager went on vacation. Then one of the consultants comes and approaches that analyst with a question. He acknowledged that there's a whole section of requirements that were completely ignored to this point, and they weren't sure exactly what they needed. And from then on, things began to unravel. Development was way behind. Components weren't addressed. Gaps in understanding became significant. Wow, this sounds like your world, doesn't it? (laughs) From then on, we discovered that the project took an additional year to complete. But this time, it took a different turn. It involved active business analysts and functional analyst participation. The experience of the vast majority of projects I've worked on, both software development and others, is that things will go wrong during design and build If you have a misunderstanding or misinterpretation that leads to taking a solution in different directions, we need to live with and come to terms with that gaps will be discovered and we need to do something to address those. That real live human beings will decide what to do with the gaps and how to interpret the ambiguities. 
and where to get the missing information it wasn't apparent during our initial analysis, and that the teams will have um, people rotate on and off vacation or on and off different projects, and those people may have a different interpretation of the very same requirements that were written. And there, of course, are components that we always look over or gloss over or miss that we have to come back and address later. And usually those are the things that are less technical because, well, they seem to be easy, so we just push them aside or brush them aside. The truth is, business analysis is not done when a requirements document is signed off on. I'm going to say that again. Business analysis is not complete when a requirements document is signed off on. Throughout the lifecycle solution, we need to make sure we're including the analyst. It's so important because they play a pivotal role to ensure that once the solution is implemented, uh, we are satisfying not just the business needs, but the consumer needs and that we're doing things in a strategic way and that we're meeting our technical objectives. It's important that we have people in place to resolve these issues. For the duration of the project, an analyst remains to be the spokesperson for the requirements that are put forth. And I say this all the time, that the BA should be the spokesperson for the end consumer, stakeholder, that the FA should be a spokesperson for the strategic readiness and whereabout, and then a TA should be a spokesperson for the delivery groups who are going to be responsible for building infrastructure and architecture and making sure we're building a system that's going to engage and work the way that we anticipate. Now, as the bulk of that initial design and inquiry And uh, so so when we're we're going through and we're doing our initialization, our ideation, and then our discovery, right? Once we do that, we need to make sure that these people stay actively involved in a project. So I had someone challenge me and ask, how does the BAFATA stay involved after that? Well, I'll give you a few tips. Here's the first one. Number one, they need to be able to recognize and analyze when new things come in. So when new backlog items need to be created, when new stories need to be created, when new work comes in, when the consumer requests additional features that weren't part of the original scope, we need to have someone who can analyze why they're asking for these things, who's asking for these things, where it sits, and what benefit it's going to give us. What is the outcome for getting these new things? And how are we going to communicate the impact of the change to everyone that needs to know, hey, there are additional things uh, being added. Number two, those analysts need to make sure that the solution, as built, aligns with both the consumer needs and with the strategy needs. So oftentimes we have just the technical stakeholder review and say, yep, in order to do A, we need to do B. And it's a very technical way to look at things, right? Very binary, very straightforward. The problem is sometimes it goes beyond that. And we need to make sure that this analyst understands that there, there needs to be some strategic alignment as well as some alignment towards outcome or perceived outcome from a consumer that's going to either make something easier or make something better. All right, coming at number three, the analysts need to make sure that they're overseeing and looking at the way things are being designed, both from a technology side, but also from a non-technology side of the solution. So when we start talking about strategic, functional, non-functional we start talking about you know, implementation pieces and use cases and regulatory and those type of things, compliance, we need to make certain that we have people who are looking over and saying, hey, are these things in line? Are we where we need to be? And I think that sometimes we gloss over those non-technology things like business process changes that are required to adopt or incorporate a solution or communicating and promoting new technology solutions and focusing on user ad- adoption, or user and training uh, documentation and materials, including creating new and updating manuals, job aids, training materials, whatever's necessary. Planning for sufficient production support, including training support teams and agreeing on a support process and framework. Changes to marketing materials, communication targeted at external and internal facing customers. Internal communication materials to explain broadcast changes to everyone who could be impacted by the product or service that you're building. These are all examples of things that fall into the uh, non-technology things that still need to be done that we often overlook. All right, how about number four? Capture and transfer to knowledge. One of the big things that Ken Schwaber said in the very beginning about Scrum was that nothing should ever leave the building without more than one set of eyes looking at it, right? During a project, oftentimes we give up 
the ability to cross pollinate for the sake or benefit of speeding things up and uh, making things go faster. And what I can tell you is that when you lose that transfer of knowledge, it is very costly to the team in the long run. Sure, it might cost a little more to have more than one set of eyes look at things, but I can tell you now, having your analysts look over things and work with the team to make sure that no, that everything that's built has more than one set of eyes looking at it is going to help you be ultimately successful in the end. Because it's important for those analysts to stay engaged throughout the whole life cycle of what's being done from cradle to grave. And I think that once you recognize that there is great value in having a BA, an FA, a TA, a BAFATA to work with the product owner, and if the product owner shouldn't be doing everything in a silo, that's when you're going to discover that the analyst is priceless and one of the most critical components to a well-oiled, high-performing Agile team. That's going to do it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have a topic you want us to cover, reach out to us at learnmoreanagiledad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And as always, we encourage you to stay healthy, stay well, and stay agile, my friends. Until next time, do take care. Yeah.